Hello everyone and welcome back to Bizarre Tales. On today's episode I want to talk about something I've always been fascinated with ever since being a child and that is ancient Egypt. Mummies, pyramids, treasure, it's always fascinated me. But I've often asked myself what started my interest with ancient Egypt and if I could pinpoint it down to one particular thing it would probably be this. No, no, not that, not that. This. Walk like an Egyptian. No, no, well maybe, but no, it's this, Tutankhamun. During the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, many ancient pharaohs ruled over the sandy lands. The 18th dynasty is perhaps the most well-known dynasty with many interesting finds by many archaeologists, including the discovery of a pharaoh who remained buried under the sand for over 3,000 years, and his name was Tutankhamun. At the age of 9 years old, Tutankhamun took the throne after the death of his father, the pharaoh Akhenaten. During his rule, Tutankhamun had made it his mission to restore some of the religious beliefs in the ancient gods that his late father had tried so hard to demolish. He was also responsible for the reconstruction of many religious monuments. At a young age, he was wed to his paternal sister and he had two daughters, one of which died during pregnancy and the other died shortly after being born. It is also believed that his mother and father were actually brother and sister and apparently this was not an uncommon thing to happen between royal families as it was a way to keep the bloodline pure. But as you can imagine, incest brings with it many genetic defects. Defects that may have hindered Tutankhamun right up until his death. It is believed that the young pharaoh may have had clubfoot because of this as well as illnesses like sclerosis. Unfortunately, the young pharaoh was not to sit on the throne for too long, and at the young age of 19, he died. And the circumstances of his death still remain a mystery to this very day. Some say he died of many strains of malaria, whilst others claim that he may have been murdered due to damage at the back of the skull. Although the damage to the skull may have been caused by rough handling when the mummy was found, or it was caused by mummification all those years ago. Another theory is that Tutankhamun died after being injured in a hunting trip, it was also discovered that his leg was shown to have been damaged only a day or two before his death. Fortunately, we may never know the exact circumstances of his death, but it is believed that he died very suddenly. And this is due to the size of his tomb, which was frankly far too small for royalty. This backs up the theory that his death was sudden, and the construction of a royal sized tomb had not been considered, and so the pharaoh was given a smaller tomb that may have been built for someone else. The tomb was filled with so many treasures and sealed up, but evidence does show that the tomb was broken into at least twice, possibly months after his death, and this is not a rare thing to have happened. But it is believed then that the tomb was simply forgotten by time and covered up by the sands of Egypt. And there he stayed, buried under the sands for over 3,000 years, forgotten to time itself. That is until 1922. A gentleman named Lord Carnarvon was quickly running out of patience. His health was failing him and his doctor had suggested warmer climates other than England to ease his illness. And so he picked Egypt and became fascinated with digging up the past. Lord Carnarvon had been funding an archaeological dig for quite some time and unfortunately the excavations he was paying for were not producing many finds. Also with the start of World War I the dig was postponed on many occasions. As you can imagine, Lord Carnarvon probably thought that his money was going to waste. It was a man named Howard Carter who was in charge of the dig, and it was to this man that Lord Carnarvon had given the bad news that he was about to pull the funding. But Howard Carter, who had worked alongside Lord Carnarvon for quite some time, was passionate and almost certain that they were coming very, very close to finding something, and he believed it was just a matter of time before that happened. And so Lord Carnarvon funded the dig once more, and it was possibly one of the best decisions ever made in the history of archaeology. On the 4th of November 1922, a young water boy accidentally stumbled upon a strange stone sticking out from the sand in the Valley of the Kings. Upon inspection, Howard Carter decided to bring his team over to start digging, and eventually that strange stone was revealed to be one of the many steps that led down to a door that was sealed with a cartouche stamped upon it, an indication that this tomb belonged to royalty. As soon as Carter realised what he had found, he quickly had the doorway filled back in and hidden beneath the sand once more. 
and sent for Lord Carnarvon to come as soon as possible. And he did. It took him two and a half weeks to travel from England to Egypt. The wait must have been excruciating. Once Lord Carnarvon had arrived, the doorway was re-dug up and Howard opened up the door and peered into the room that had been sealed for 3,000 years or so. As Fowler that had been trapped for thousands of years escaped through the damaged stone, the candle that Carter was holding flickered as he peered inside the tomb, allowing his eyes to adjust to the light. And when they did, his eyes viewed items that had not been seen by anyone for thousands of years. Lord Carnarvon asked Howard what did he see, to which Howard replied, Wonderful things. Inside the first part of the tomb, Carter could see jewels, clothing, gems and statues, weapons and even a few toys, and gold, so much gold, everything the king needed to help him in the afterlife. And they hadn't even reached the burial room yet, which held the coffin of the king, which held another coffin, a bit like those Russian nestling dolls, only the inside coffin was made of gold. And then of course there was a beautiful face mask that was also made of gold. All in all, there were over 5,000 artifacts found within the tomb. It would seem that they had made the find of the century. Now, it is said at the very same time the tomb was opened, Carter had sent a messenger back to his living accommodations. On approaching Carter's home, the messenger noticed a cobra had slivered inside a birdcage that held Carter's canary and killed the bird. This is believed to be the start of what many believe was the mummy's curse. Many people believe this is the start of the curse because the image of the cobra represents an Egyptian god. The image of a cobra guards the gates of the underworld and protects royalty from their enemies and help guide royalty through the underworld. The cobra can also be seen on the head of the king's face mask. Had Carter just feeled his fate for himself and all of the men in his employ. Now, to say that this find was massive would be an understatement. The tomb of Tutankhamun is one of history's most famous archaeological achievements, unlocking a tomb that was still intact and full of so much treasure, as well as the king himself. So, of course, the newspapers became interested. Carter became a celebrity overnight, and everyone wanted to know the latest news from the dig in the Valley of the Kings. But this was getting in the way of some very important excavating that needed doing. And so, not one to let the opportunity of making a quick book passing by, Lord Carnarvon sold exclusive rights to the information of the digs to the London Times for £5,000 and an amazing 75% of all profits. And so now the London Times held all the exclusive rights to the information coming from the dig whilst other newspapers were left behind. So of course they had to make up other stories, pure fabrications, lies to sell more papers. And this is where the stories of the curse was born, where it was truly born. Pushing the belief that a curse hung over the opening of the tomb even going as far as to reporting that the curse was written on the inside of the tomb, but it most certainly was not. Although curses have been found on other tombs, this was not the case on this occasion. It was simply the rival newspapers fabricating stories to sell more papers. But, six weeks after the fine, Lord Carnarvon had been bitten by a mosquito. After shaving, he accidentally cut the bite and the bite became infected and unfortunately this resulted in blood poisoning and due to his already poor health it proved too much and sadly he didn't survive. Lord Carnarvon died at the age of 56 only six weeks after opening the tomb and he died before the excavation made it to the burial chamber that was the final resting place at Tutankhamun. Meanwhile back in England that high clear castle and if that sounds familiar to you it must mean that you're a Downton Abbey fan because that is where the series is filmed and where Lord Carnarvon lived. Well, apparently back home in England, at the precise time of the death of Lord Carnarvon, his dog Susie let out an owl and fell to the floor dead. Although his dog did die, this may have been dramatised by the press. And of course the newspapers jumped onto this straight away. One paper had a headline that read, Did King Tut poison Lord Carnarvon? And another headline said, Tomb digging to go on despite curse of Egypt. It was also reported that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes books, believed that Lord Carnarvon was killed by mystical elementals created by the ancient king's priests. Once the mummy was finally brought out of the tomb and an autopsy was done on the ancient king, it was found that he had an abrasion on his left cheek. Maybe on the same cheek that Lord Carnarvon was bitten, but this could not be proven as no one could remember which cheek the bite was upon and he had been buried for almost six months already. It was also said that on the night of Lord Carnarvon's death, all the lights went out in Cairo and two Egyptian men who worked with Carter were also found dead. And it didn't end there. On the 23rd of September 1923, Lord Carnarvon's half-brother died of blood poisoning after a dental operation went wrong somehow. 
And guess where he just spent his last vacation? Yep, Egypt. Another gentleman who was said to have been affected by the curse was a Mr. George J. Gold. In 1923, he had visited the tomb and shortly after he developed a fever in Egypt and later died of pneumonia on the French Riviera after leaving Egypt. A young prince had also visited the tomb of King Tut and shortly after the visit, the 23-year-old prince was shot dead by his wife of only six months on the 10th of July, 1923, over a year after the initial discovery of the tomb. Another gentleman who was said to have been affected by the curse was a scientist named Archibald Douglas Reed. This man had ran x-rays on the mummy and apparently fell ill the very next day, and three weeks later he was dead, and apparently the cause was never discovered. And then we have Hugh Evelyn White, who was an English archaeologist who was one of the first people to actually enter the chamber that held King Tut's body. Later on in life he returned to Leeds in England and took his own life whilst travelling in a cab. This act of suicide was explained by a note that was left behind. The note said, I have succumbed to a curse which forces me to disappear. There are so many other deaths that have been blamed on the mummy's curse, such as Sir Lee Stack, Governor General of the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, who was also one of the first people to enter the tomb. Six months later, he was shot dead. Professor Aaron Ember was a very respectful Egyptologist and was considered an expert on everything ancient. He died in 1926 after his house caught fire. Apparently, he had the chance to leave the house, but instead decided to linger in a desperate attempt to save an Egyptian book he had been working on called The Book of the Dead, and in doing so, he perished. Rumour has it, the book was given to him by Howard Carter. Another gentleman named Sir Bruce Ingham had also been gifted an item from Carter. This time it was not a book, but a mummified hand with a bracelet upon it, with an inscription that read, Cursed be he who moves my body, to him shall come fire, water and pestilence. It is said that after receiving the gift from Carter, Ingham's house burned down. He then had the house rebuilt, and then it was damaged in a flood. After it was rebuilt once again, it is rumoured that it was damaged once more by fire. Another gentleman named Captain Richard Bethel, who was Carter's personal secretary, was found dead in 1929 in his bed, and there are rumours that he may have been smothered. And in 1930, his father had committed suicide by throwing himself out of the window on the seventh floor of his apartment. And apparently his room had multiple lost artefacts from the tomb of Tutankhamun. As time went on, more and more deaths were blamed on the curse. But in reality, the human race do not live forever, and everyone eventually dies. But that does not mean it is necessarily a curse. And of course we have to consider that most of these reports came from the very newspapers that like to fabricate information to make a story seem mysterious and fantastical. But what of Howard Carter himself who actually opened the tomb? Well, he actually lived to the age of 64 and he died of Hodgkin's disease alone in his London flat in 1939. It was later found out that Carter had kept at least 18 artefacts from the tomb for himself and these were eventually returned to the museum. Did the curse of Tutankhamun catch up with Carter almost 17 years later? Considering he was the one who opened the tomb, and he had so many artefacts, you would think that the curse of the mummy would have fallen upon him the hardest. Or was it simply just his time and he died of natural causes and there simply was no curse? As always, I'll let you decide. Until next time, take care and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye bye.